I'm John Battelle, um, chairman and founder of Federated Media. I've uh, been involved in three different conversations here, uh, one with Doc Searles around the role of the consumer in, in the data ecosystem, uh, another uh, with uh, Richard Rosenblatt, the founder and CEO of Demand Media, recently public uh, and uh, controversial uh, media company. Uh, and then uh, another on the conversation uh, around uh, the, the, I guess you could say it, the combat between premium publishers and ad networks, exchanges, trading desks, DSPs. Um, that's about to happen and I think that's going to be very interesting. <laughs> the, the new infrastructure that's being put into place by in particularly agencies um, on behalf of their large marketing clients uh, it doesn't look really much different to me than ad networks, which have been around since the internet. Uh, the difference being that the agencies are starting to take a little bit more control and responsibility uh, and accountability for what they're buying and what the return on investment is and whether or not the price is right. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, the publishers uh, are afraid that um, if they put their inventory into these trading desks or exchanges, their inventory will be undercut and not priced appropriately and they won't receive the premium that they think they deserve. Um, and, and to that I say, well, earn it. I mean, I, I, I don't know really how else to put it, you know. If you are valuable, um, you will be priced accordingly. We're in a turbulent period where people don't know if they put that inventory into an exchange uh, that it will be properly priced. And the truth is it won't. Uh, and it won't, we're in a sort of chicken and egg problem here. Uh, if everybody who's a premium publisher keeps their inventory out, outside of these new, you know, data-driven uh, exchanges, then we will not find the right market price because the inventory that is in there will be lower quality inventory and the prices will stay low. Um, so the question is, how can you put your inventory in there without losing your shorts? Uh, and I think that that is not an easy question to answer and it's one that over time we're going to resolve. One way we resolve it is what you're seeing a trend towards which is premium publishers creating their own ad networks, uh, sort of supply side platforms where they say okay well we'll we're pooled together which was just announced yesterday, Q which is Hearst and Gannett and New York Times. Uh, we'll pool together premium inventory and so hey buyers you can buy from this bucket and there's scale in here and you know it's high quality but here's the price uh, you know floor so in that example will they only use their own ad network only their own and they're not using any others so, so, that's so they're pulling inventory from everywhere else right uh, and you know if I were an ad network I'd be a little concerned about that uh, if I'm a buyer Right, a DSP or, or a, uh, a trading desk, uh, agency trading desk, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. But, you know, I might quibble with whether or not your price is right, and we can have that negotiation and that argument. Now, the business I'm in um, is we're not an ad network. Now, we are a network of sites, so people think we're an ad network, um, but we're not. Um, we have a lot of technology, we have the ability to sell across all the federations of our sites in various ways using third party network data, using our own data. Um, uh, but what we really kind of hang our hat on is our ability to do highly integrated, highly conversational, highly you know, uh, engaged uh, marketing executions that uh, are in the right environment and provide results for marketers. Um, and that is, to me, a unique offering that allows us uh, the right to charge a premium. Number one, we've put a circle around what we call the independent web and the best of the independent web. And we say, in this environment, your message will amplify. It will resonate. And number two, we don't just run ads. We run programs and campaigns. And we do a lot of custom work. Um, but we understand how to do that on a platform with a process and with products that scale. Um, and that's not easy to do. But we, we were born kind of after Google, so to speak, and we are native to this environment, so we don't carry a lot of the baggage of old media companies of how you sell, what kind of programs you're willing to do, um, how you integrate content into marketing and other things. Um, so I kind of look at this ad network war and think it's like intellectually extremely interesting, um, but I don't 
really feel like I'm, you know, too affected by it at, at the moment. If this ongoing battle between premium publishers, uh, ad networks, exchanges, trading desks, uh, drives up the overall sense of the value of, you know, uh, marketing inventory, great. You know, I can only say, you know, the higher the better. Because I know that the programs that I'm involved with will always be valued at a higher level than that base. So, I would shy away from being called a creative agency just in that that business is a very real and you know important and difficult business to be in. Um, do we have lots of creative ideas? Yes. Um, and do we work with creative and strategic parts of the agency world to execute them? Absolutely. Um, but can we, you know, do the work that they do? No. You know, we can help, we can provide input, feedback, ideas, we can even build stuff if they want us to build stuff, right? And oftentimes they will ask us to build stuff because we're in an environment where a lot of agencies don't have um, a lot of experience, right? You know, for the last three, four years, agencies hadn't really been in the business of building blog, you know, driven content marketing experiences. And we have literally thousands of people who are our partners who that's all they do all day right so we can put the agencies together with that creative force and good things happen but I wouldn't call us an agency per se I think it's table stakes now for media companies at scale to have a creative services business that understands how to translate their offerings to marketers and those marketers can be the client the clients creative agency, the client's media agency, all three, you know, so it doesn't have to be either or. And in our case, I don't consider ourselves sort of in competition with the agency business. As a matter of fact, we, I mean, they're really one of our core clients. Um, so we try to amplify, we listen and try to translate to the properties we have. And I think a great media company just has to be good at that now. It, the, the, the days of saying, here are the slots I've got, buy them or don't, I just don't think we're in that business. It really varies um, almost day to day. Um, uh, our inventory is very elastic. We aren't an owned and operated publisher. I mean, we own and operate um, sort of hub sites like Food Buzz, but Food Buzz is, is really a curation of 4,500 sites we don't own, which, which are all passionate food bloggers. Um, so we don't really concern ourselves too much with what our fill rates are. I mean, we absolutely, because we have publishing partners, if we're not selling premium inventory or integrated programs related to premium inventory, we will then manage, you know, third-party networks for them. Um, but what we worry most about is, are we making our partners more money, you know, this year than we made them last year? That's, that's, that's what we, that's what keeps us up at night, right? Um, that said, I think there's an opportunity to build some things that have not yet been built in this space. Um, and, and it's really exciting, actually, what, what, what could be done. Um, Can you share some examples? Well, sure. I mean, uh, we haven't announced this yet, so Deanna might kill me. But um, we're in beta with a, a product we call Conversation Targeting. Uh, and uh, what this product is, is it's a combination of some of the acquisitions that we've made over the past uh, year. Um, we crawl our whole network. Um, which is, you know, a lot of sites. Um, and we have now a fresh index of every piece of content on those sites. And this is a lot of content. It's uh, about the same amount, if not more, uh, as demand media, for example. Um, very different kinds of content, of course. Um, and I have a lot of respect for demand, but our content is all sort of, you know, created by passionate individuals who have a point of view and are saying, you know, here's a recipe that I really love and, you know, here's my rant about how I hate this government regulation. I mean, it, you know, depending on whether it's Boing Boing or Food Buzz, it's going to be a very different kind of content. But we crawl all of that. We run it through a semantic search platform so that we understand actually what the content is about. Not what keywords are on the page, but what it's about semantically. What, what its meaning is. And then we relate those concepts to shoulder concepts. And then we identify all of our inventory by meaning, right? Um, and then our, w what we built is an ad product that allows people to, uh, marketers, to put messaging next to conversations about things that mean things. So maybe Verizon wants to own the conversation across the independent web around tablets 
right? Or around phone plans, you know? Or around people bitching about AT&T. Or around people bitching about AT&T, exactly, right? And before, it was very hard to buy that in the space that we represent, which is the independent web, because you'd have to go make 4,000 media buys, right? And you just can't do that. Or you just dump money into an ad network and cross your fingers, right, that it works out. But we've built that kind of technology across the entire network, right? So you could say, you know, that's us surfacing an ad network like product above the level of a single site, right? Um, and I'm excited by the potential of that. Uh, but we could only do that if we acquired, you know, a technology platform, uh, a search platform, you know, uh, built a, 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 a scaled infrastructure that allows us to store structure, um, analyze, and draw intelligence from you know, a database of, of this information. Um, and we have three or four products that are going to stack on top of that. So we're building a bunch of things that, in essence, I think any smart publisher has to do. If you're a publisher at scale, which we are, you must understand your audience and your community. You must create products that add value to them and add value to the marketer. And, l and let's not forget, your, our third client, in our case, is our publisher, right? So we have to keep all three parties happy. Um, and that's our business. Uh, so I'm excited by, 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 I'm excited by things like that. So. Uh, with, with the semantic technologies, did, did you build that technology in-house or did you partner We bought it. We bought it. There's you a, bought it as a new we bought the company that has the patents and, and, and built the technology. Okay. Um, it rolled out a CNET actually and was an independent company and, and uh, it was sort of a really, really good technology and a really good technology team in search of a, a reason for it to be implemented, and, and, and we, we found a good reason. I think everyone's frustrated with uh, the, the, you know, fragmentation of this business right now. Uh, I think everybody who sits at the table thinks they have a great solution, um, and they probably do. Uh, the problem is, is that the buyers who drive the market uh, can't buy every solution. <laughs> Uh, whether it's a publishing solution, I've got this great audience. Uh, whether it's a data solution, you know, you should use my data, Mr. Publisher, or you should use my data, Mr. Marketer. Um, or whether it's a, uh, a service that, in one way or another, you know, increases yield, or, I mean, you, you see, it, it's all here, right? And, and they all have great ideas. The problem is, is that we can't all keep up with it, right? And, and, and we don't know which of the four similar services we should use, and we don't have time to test all four. Um, so we're sort of in this market figuring it out phase that I think frustrates everybody because we all know how big this business, not only it's a big business right now, it's a very big business, but we know how, that it could get, you know, as Eric Schmidt said at the opening of the conference, you know, it's 26 billion now, but it should be, two, uh, it should be 200 billion, right? Um, so we all know it's got a 10x growth curve, you know, and everybody wants that to happen. The question is, you know, can we get to the sort of what I think is inevitable over the next three or four years, which is a consolidation? You know, there are going to be winners and losers, but the ones that are truly adding a lot of value are going to become consolidators and say, oh, well, I love what you're doing here, but you're in the wrong market space, and I want to, you know. And so if you think about what, what, what we've done at FM, when we've bought three, four companies in the last year, we want to be one of those consolidators. We want to be one of those companies that kind of identifies the, some portions of the ecosystem and says, come with us and let's go, you know, let's go win. So I think everyone's nervous about that, right? If you're a publisher or if you're a, a startup with a great new technology that helps ad optimization or, you know, it's a new ad, ad network idea, you're wondering, am I buying? Am I being bought? Am I being left by this, you know, am I being left at the altar by somebody else? I mean, there's a lot of that tension in the room. And this community, what are they saying about the Make it easy for me. It's too freaking hard. It's too hard to buy, right? The whole reason that you see these DSPs and, and trading desks popping up and uh, so many ad networks is they're all trying to solve the one problem, which is it's too damn hard for me, A, to buy at scale, B, to prove that my buying dollar is being used uh, effectively, uh, and C, you know, rinse and repeat, right? And so uh, I can do that with TV. How come I can't do that with online? There's so many problems with that, I, that concept that it's hard, it's hard to unpack it in you know, a short period of time. One of them is, this isn't television, okay? Get over it, you know? This is harder, it should be harder, because it should be higher reward. Now, people who understand that, marketers, say, okay, 
show me the higher reward. Like, I, I'm not seeing it. My answer to that is, you're not committed enough, right? You can't be in this business and not be in relationship with your customers directly. You have to be in conversation with them. And not just for a campaign, always. You have to be committed all the time. Which means you rethink your whole infrastructure of how you do business. Which is not going to happen in a year. <laughs> you know? and, but, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not television. But they're right to say, at some point, it should be that I can say, I'm going to apply these dollars and this creative idea and this messaging to this market and I shouldn't have to spend 19 or 20 or 30 percent of my dollars on administration of that, right? Um, I think that's fair. Once they've sunk their costs into creating an, a, an infrastructure as a marker that allows them to have a conversation directly with their customers, it shouldn't cost 30 percent. But when you think about that 30 percent, I would put it into your own company, understanding how to re-engineer it so that you are not just like paying a PR person to post updates to your Twitter handle and your Facebook page, right? That's not customer relationships.